All right. So um, inviting you into a posture um, to practice and um, we'll begin by reciting the refuges, you know, which are like, to me, uh, a homecoming every time, uh, an important reminder of the foundations of practice, which um, I could interpret as, you know, as um, resting in belief in the possibility of awakening for each of us and the, and the possibility of, of um, just really being present and alive and awake to our lives as they happen. Um, the second refuge being like resting in, in trust in the path, trust in um, living a life according to the teachings. And the third, the third precept really resting in trust of the Sangha, of the community of practitioners and more widely like the community of all beings that we're, we're all enmeshed in, right? The, the state of interdependence for all of us. Um, and then after that, we'll recept the, the precepts, you know, the, the guidelines on ethical conduct that um, I find really in returning to them really help me make decisions to lead a life like in alignment with, with my values. Okay. So I will chant. Um, feel free to join me, you know, silently with your sound off at home or just to listen if chanting practice isn't something that you do. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama sambuddhasa. Namo tassa bhagavato arahato sama Sambuddhasa Udang Saranang Gachami Damang Saranang Gachami Sangang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Budang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Damang Saranang Gachami Dutiampi Sangang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Budang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Damang Saranang Gachami Tatiampi Sangang Saranang Gachami And now I'll recite the precepts. Panatipata veramani sika padang samadhyami. Adina dana veramani sika padang samadhyami. Kamisu Michachara Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Musawada Veramani Sika Padang Samadhyami Sura Maraya Maja Pamadatana Veramani 
Sika padang samadhyami. Idam misilam megafala nanasa pachayo ho tu. Sadhu, 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 anumudami. So I think we'll practice first, and then I will say some things about um, the fourth hindrance, restlessness and worry. Um, so yeah, I invite you to find a posture, a posture where you're both relaxed and awake. Really any posture is fine, be it sitting, standing, lying down. Um, people often sit in a way where they have a, a stable base, um, a posture where the, the spine is, is upright, if you're in a sitting or standing posture where the shoulders are relaxed, the chest and heart are open, the belly soft. So uh, an alert, but open resting posture. And in this, this bodily shape that you find yourself in, it can be helpful sometimes to, to choose an anchor. An anchor such as the breath, you know, this breath that is with us for the whole duration of our life. Maybe noticing the sensation of the breath as it enters and exits the nostrils. Or the sound of my housemate making a smoothie, <laughs> which might have just entered your, <laughs> your auditory realm. Awareness of sound can be really grounding. Noticing sound that is nearby, like even the sound of your own breath. or noticing sound that is further away in the kitchen, other people or beings in the space that you inhabit at the moment, or sounds outside. There are often sirens that pass by my house with some proximity. Just allowing the, the mind to gently rest on 
the arrival and the departure of sound. Or you might want to rest awareness on the whole body or on a certain body part, for example, the hands, bringing awareness to the hands, noticing all the subtle sensations present. And noticing humidity, noticing the movement of energy, noticing heat, noticing your own touch, if your hands are resting on your thighs or if your hands are touching each other. Gently sharpening your awareness by coming back to present moment sensation again and again and again. What's alive in your interior landscape at the moment? What's the texture of that experience? Is there any restlessness or worry present? And if so, what is the experience of restlessness or worry? for you right now. On a physical level, on an emotional level, on a spiritual level. And if restlessness or worry are absent, noticing that, what does it feel like to have an experience that is free from restlessness and worry right now? Really paying attention.
As the attention collects itself and the body and mind settle, is it possible to open to awareness of the friendliness of present moment awareness to open to this like subtle but palpable sweetness, kindness that I I guess I perceive as like an, an enveloping presence that is always there. that I can feel when I stop, pause, and I listen. Just gently coming back to present moment awareness again and again. When you notice that the mind is in the past or in the future planning,
We, we put our bodies to bed. Well, most of us put our bodies to bed at night to, to let the body rest. But the mind, the mind is often active all the time. In the practice of meditation allows the mind to rest. You know, it gives it permission to do much less to just be here now. I'd like to invite you to bring awareness to the out breath. To letting go. And seeing what impact this has on the body.
in these last few minutes of practice, if it feels accessible to you, seeing if there's any well-being or kindness that you can offer yourself from within. It might take the form of just a, a wordless kind intention of well being. Or to take the form of the feeling of being under a warm, nourishing sun. Bathing the whole body. Or maybe words feel right to you. You know, silently repeating to yourself, may I be healthy. May I be well. May I be loving and surrounded by love. And expanding that radiant intention around you. Into the space you're in. Into your loving relationships. With people, with animals, with plants, with all forms of life you interact with. and including each other. Sharing this radiant kindness with this Sangha here today. And if this practice involves effort, letting go of efforting, and just allowing yourself to be kindness, 
effortlessly. Taking a few final breaths as we prepare to close this practice. So thank you for your practice today. It's always sort of surprisingly beautiful to me how the support of Sangha is so palpable even via Zoom. Like, we don't have to be in the same place. Um, so thank you for this shared, this shared awareness, this shared groundedness. I feel different than when I arrived. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, if you need to stretch or move, please do. So today I'm going to continue talking about hindrances. Um yeah, Daryl has been working, as you well know, Daryl's been working through the Satipatthana Sutta slowly. And today um, is about the hindrance of restlessness and worry. So the hindrances being these experiences that show up in our practice and hinder mindfulness or hinder our awareness. And, you know, restlessness literally means without rest. So being in a state of, of agitation, a state of distracted excitement, you know, it can be physical, mental, emotional, or spiritual. Um, and 
worry refers to you know being in a having a mind state of anxiety um, often about the past you know rehashing worrying about something that we've said or done or worry about the future like what's going to happen um, which really both of which take us out of present moment experience um, I'm not sure if Daryl has talked about the similes the Buddha used to describe the hindrances. Um, she probably has, but I'll go over them again anyway. So in, in its like unobstructed mindful state, um, the mind can be compared to a, a bowl of clear water that, um, reflects our image as it is if we were to look into it but when desire the first hindrance is present it's as if a a colored dye were suffused into the water so it colors our perception um, another metaphor i like is is imagining putting on like colored glasses that then affect our perception of everything having seeing everything through the lens of desire. Um, and when aversion or anger are present, the water is boiling. So it's, it's full of angry or harmful energy. And when water's boiling, you can't really see through it clearly. Again, you know, it's full of like movement and bubbles. And, and when sloth and torpor, the third hindrance are present, the water is overgrown with algae. It's really stagnant, there's no movement, it kind of stinks probably, like the scum in a swamp. Um, and again, you can't really cl clearly see through it. And when restlessness and worry are present, you know, today's topic, the water is, is being stirred up by a wind it's being tossed about here and there you know it's really agitated um, and the fifth hindrance which will be talked about in another week is is doubt and when doubt is present the water is is muddied it's muddied by doubt so for all of the hindrances um, instructions on how to relate to them in the Satipatthana Sutta are, are the same. So the first thing to do is to recognize when a hindrance is present or to recognize when a hindrance is absent, which I invited you to do in the practice. Like what is the experience of restlessness and worry when they're present or what is the experience of their absence? Just knowing knowing these different states, knowing the difference between them. And then the second thing to do is to know the conditions that lead to the arising of a hindrance and also the conditions that lead to the, lead to the removal of a hindrance. So this involves some investigation, investigating your mind state, investigating your reactions. And then third is knowing what conditions prevent the future arising of a hindrance. Um, and and in, in working with the hindrances, conditionality is really important here, like being really aware of what conditions lead to restlessness and worry coming up for you. Like in what, in what situations are they there? Um, and although hindrances are typically talked about in the context of practice, you know, which formal practice like we've done today, um, I'm going to talk about restlessness and worry in life in general, because like, what is practice? Is practice just the time on the cushion or is practice your whole life? Um, so when reflecting about times when restlessness and worry are present for me, a really big, easy one that came up is before air travel. <laughs> um, you know, feeling 
really worried. Am I going to sleep through my 4 a.m. alarm? Is my friend going to actually come and pick me up? Should I schedule a cab to just in case? Like just all the, the manifestations of a busy, worrying mind. And um, when this happens, right, it can be it can be hard to pause, but if you're able to pause and relax or not even relax, just pause and notice like dropping into the felt sensation of restlessness and worry. So for me, the, it manifests as a tension. Often my, my shoulders are tight, like my body just feels tight. Um, I have an inability to focus in this state of anxiety. And uh, Analio talks about exploring the texture of the mind that's under the influence of a hindrance, like tasting it, savoring it, getting a clear sense of its flavor. Like what's the flavor of restlessness and worry? Because it's, it's a really distinct experience that we all have. And uh, many years ago, probably a decade ago, I got up at 4 a.m. in New York City, to take the subway to JFK airport to make a 7.30 a.m. flight. And I thought I had plenty of time. Little did I know that the trains at 4 a.m. are really slow. And, um, and I felt my anxiety, you know, mount as I was still on the subway at like 5.30, 6 o'clock. I think I arrived at the airport at 6.30, like really anxious, like, and having spent like a lot of energy wanting the trains to move faster. And like, but of course, like all of this is, is beyond my control. Like I can't make the New York City subways move. Um, and I, I missed my flight and I was rescheduled on another flight the same day. And it ended up not being a big deal. It wasn't a big deal, <laughs> but instead of just like, letting this experience be when I was trying to get there, I hemorrhaged so much energy between like four and 7 a.m., like creating so much stress and suffering in my being. And so like investigating the conditionality, you know, what led to restlessness and worry arising in me then? Well, the main thing that I can identify is was wanting to control something that was beyond my control and resisting what was actually happening. I was resisting that I was missing my flight instead of just being like, who cares? Like this happens to hundreds, thousands of people every day. Who cares? Right. Um, so like, what could I do to prevent this from happening? Well, one, I've never scheduled an early morning flight in New York City again. But also, more importantly, I reflect on like how I can do my best to let life happen not according to my plan. How can I let life happen not according to my plan? How can I surrender and cultivate a flexibility of mind to roll with what arises when what is happening is not what I want. Like one of my teachers, Paul Haller, recently talked about the, the dreamlike quality of the world according to me. And, and he asked, like, how can I invite an awakeness or an, or an awareness to loosen the world according to me? to loosen my like tight grasp on wanting the world to be a particular way. So often worry is about, you know, anticipated problems. Um, I've experienced what I would call anticipatory grief <laughs> you know, worrying about a loved one leaving before they've even left. Like while I'm still with them, like feeling sad about them leaving, uh, which very much feels like a wind blowing 
on the waters of my experience, like pushing me away from the present. Um, or, you know, I'll worry about things that have happened in the past, things that I've said or done. Like I remember when I, when I was a student at McGill years ago, I would have these experience, these really strong moments of regret of like really kicking myself when I'd be walking home from an exam and the correct answer to a question I just answered incorrectly would come to me. <laughs> and, and you know, you almost want to like yell the right answer as if I could change what was on the paper I'd submitted. And, and like what led, what conditions led to this? And it, it was a, a perfectionism, having really high, sometimes unkind standards for myself. Instead of just accepting that like human beings do our best and we make mistakes. Like that's the beautiful mess of being a human being. Um, so in all these situations where hindrances arise, again, the effort becomes to really like drop into the felt sensation of the hindrance to know it. First, dropping the storyline, just being with the body and then mindfully investigating it, investigating its conditionality. And um, I, I find that coming back to the, the precepts, the guidelines on ethical conduct can be a really um, supportive way to prevent the arising of restlessness and worry. Um, and I'll say them again, and we recited them at the beginning. Um, so the first one, and I'll say them in both their positive, their negative and positive formulations, like things not to do and things to do, because both of those side by side feel more supportive than either one on its own. So the first precept being not to kill um, and to support life. And you know, killing can be, we can, killing can mean like actual killing, actual like murder, death of things, but killing can also be um, more subtle perhaps, like shutting down someone else's ideas, like shutting down, not, not being able to listen to someone. And so like, how does killing, reflecting on how does killing manifest in your life, right? literally and more symbolically. Um, the second precept is to not steal and to only take what is freely given. Third precept is to not engage in sexual misconduct and to honor the erotic energy of the body. Fourth is to not engage in harmful or untruthful speech and to speak with kindness and truthfulness. And the fifth is not to intoxicate the mind and to cultivate a clear mind, right? So like often regrets for me and I assume other people emerge when our actions aren't totally aligned with our ethics. So maybe I, lied to someone or took something that I shouldn't have, or I shut someone down, you know, so regularly coming back to the precepts really helps me uphold them. Um, an example, like there are, I live in New Orleans and there are cockroaches and sometimes mice in my house. And it feels just like an ongoing struggle with cohabitating with creatures that I don't really want to cohabitate with. <laughs> um, but I also don't want to be killing them. Um, and for a long time, I had a, a like an, a, what I now call an electrocution chamber, like a, a zapper in my kitchen. Um, and I am personally responsible because, through that terrible device for the murder of probably like 12 or 15 mice in two years. 
all of whom I buried in the backyard, their precious little bodies. And I felt like terrible. I felt terrible doing this. And I don't know why it took me so long to um, purchase a like catch and release trap. It was a Buddhist friend who, who was like, you're not in alignment with your ethics. Just like get a different trap. And I did, I got a catch and release trap. And so now I've like taken it to the park and like let these little creatures run out. And I don't know what their lives are after that, but just making a simple life change made me experience a lot less regret and worry. So getting in alignment with, with the precepts really is a super helpful antidote to this hindrance arises arising. Yeah. So I, I've said it again, but um, I've said it before, I mean, but I'll say it again, because it really is the key thing. Like when restlessness and worry arise, noticing the experience in yourself, right? Restlessness and worry are like this. But then as a next step, recognizing that this state, being in the grips of restlessness and worry is temporary. It's impermanent. It's, it's really easy to remember a time in which you didn't experience restlessness or worry, right? Um, so it so it follows that that like that these states are are passing things and they are not me or mine. Um, and and when you don't take any particular mind state personally, when you don't identify it with when you don't identify with it. Um, it's easier to just watch these states arise and pass away like everything else. They just come and go and trusting that everything just arises and passes away. Is it much easier to ride the wave of these experiences? Um, I really appreciated um, Joseph Goldstein's very practical suggestion to just open your eyes when you notice that you're you're lost in a stream of thought. You know, if you notice that you're you're feeling really anxious, um, just open your eyes, pause, and look around, noticing that like you're not in the future, you're not in the past, you're you're right here now. What is actually happening right now? outside of all the things that are happening in our like wild mind realm, right? And like, as I mentioned in the, in the meditation, you know, that subtle sense of joy, Analio often refers to the, the subtle sense of joy that you can find in present moment awareness, this friendliness of present moment awareness. Is it possible to relax into this even for a moment? Because when you are, when you are, when your awareness is in the present, even just for an instant, it is not worrying. And there's like a little tiny bit of space in there, right? And similarly, when the when the mind is restless, agitated, it can be really helpful to focus on the out breath, to focus on on letting go, like inviting calm inviting, yeah, and just inviting letting go into the body. Um, so um, the examples I chose to talk about were, you know, mainly from like regular life. Um, but I do want to speak a little bit to restlessness and worry in meditation practice. Um, and like what happens when they when they arise while you are formally practicing. And sometimes the things that are arising that we're worrying about are things that we actually need to take care of. Um, you know, I don't know, worrying about caring for a parent or worrying about doing your taxes on time, whatever, you might be meditating and something comes up for you. And like, what do you do in this moment? Um, it can be really helpful to just say to yourself, like, 
trust me, I will, I will get to this. After this meditation period, after this half hour, I will, I will tend to you. But right now I am practicing and actually doing that, like telling the self, I will get to this and coming back to present a moment, to present moment awareness, practicing and afterwards doing the thing um, that like cultivates some like self-trust, some self, you know, reliance here. And in practice too, restlessness and worry can um, manifest in the form of, of striving, you know, of, of wanting your practice to look a particular way, you know, worrying about a so-called like bad sit, uh, about coming to the cushion and being really distracted and wondering why things aren't the way you wish they could be. Um, and here it can be really helpful to, to actively let go of having any goals in practice other than, other than coming to practice in a regular way, but not having particular goals about how you want your practice to look. Um, the Buddha gives the example of a, of a stringed instrument. Um, he, he's talking about a lute. <laughs> it's not the most common instrument that I have around me these days, so <laughs> really any stringed instrument. The metaphor works with any stringed instrument. Um, but he says that if the strings are too tight, right, it's impossible to play. And if the strings are too loose, it's also impossible to play. The, the tension of the strings needs to be just right for the instrument to be tuned and for the instrument to be playable. And it's, it's really the, the same thing in our practice. Um, we can't bring like, like a, a, a striving tight perfectionist effort that's like too tight to practice. And we also can't bring total laxity you know, that is veering towards sloth and torpor to practice. So what's that like middle place? What's that middle place of effort where there's awakeness, where there's a gentle effort that cultivates like a wide open present moment grounded awareness? Um, yeah. So I think I would like to end here. Um, we have, we might end a little bit early, but 15, 20 minutes. Um, here, I'll just end this recording. <laughs>